In the AskMrWizard.com movie entitled Ping, the network troubleshooter's favorite tool, we showed how one internet-compatible computer can send a ping message to another, receiving a response as if it had bounced back. If you haven't seen that movie yet, you should watch it before proceeding here, because this movie builds on those concepts, and it explains how to issue commands from a DOS window, and format command lines of the type we'll be showing here in the segments that follow. For this movie, let's shift our vantage point inside the Internet so we can watch that ping operation in greater detail. All Internet Protocol packets include a provision for expiration if they spend too much time traveling around the Internet. This provision is useful because it is possible for misconfigured Internet routers to send packets in the wrong direction. When another router sends them back in the right direction, they can end up bouncing back and forth forever. For example, suppose we have a single PC that wants to send a ping packet to MIT.edu, as described in the prior movie on ping. Furthermore, suppose that one of the routers between our PC and MIT.edu is misconfigured, so that it doesn't know where MIT.edu can be found and it mistakenly sends our packet back in the direction from whence it came. That packet would end up bouncing back and forth between two routers forever if no special provision had been made. Accordingly, every Internet packet includes a field named Time to Live, or TTL, and each router that forwards a packet always decrements that value. When the computer originating a message builds the outgoing packet, it makes, it makes a conservative estimate of the number of router hops that will be needed to traverse the Internet to the destination, and the Time to Live field is initialized accordingly. A typical trip across the Internet may need to pass through about 15 router hops, but because this value is always estimated conservatively, the originating Time to Live value, or TTL field, is generally set to 32 or more. Most operating systems take the easy way out and always send all outgoing TTL fields to the same high starting value. You can learn a lot more about Internet Protocol packets and the reasons why they are organized as they are by watching the AskMrWizard.com movie entitled Ethernet Delivers the Internet. Normally, as each router forwards a packet toward its destination, the process of decrementing the Time to Live field is not very interesting. However, if a packet has been bouncing around between routers for long enough to use up its planned Time to Live, the router that decrements it to zero is expected to generate a courtesy message back to the originator, as if to say, Excuse me, I'm the router with IP address 4.79.2.2 and I found a packet that you were trying to send through me to MIT.edu. It must be really old because its time to live has expired. I have discarded the packet, but I figured you ought to be alerted because the recipient isn't ever going to receive it. Sorry. Now it's rare for a computer to receive an unexpected message like that because misconfigured routers tend to be quickly detected and corrected in today's modern, internet-dependent world. But Internet developers figured out a very clever way to use the Time to Live facility to discover the route that a packet takes through the routers constituting the worldwide Internet as it works its way to a destination. The most common network diagnostic tool that takes advantage of this clever technique is named Traceroute, for which every popular modern operating system includes a free implementation. Like the ping command, Traceroute is best entered as a command line from a DOS window, and the address of a, of a remote destination computer is included in the command. The traceroute utility then generates a ping message addressed to the destination computer and sends it on its way in the usual manner. However, instead of sending the time to live field to some conservative value like 64, it is set to 1. This, of course, means that the first router along the data path decrements the time to live field to zero and thinks to itself, uh -oh. Whoa! This must be a really old packet. I'd better discard it and alert the sender that it didn't get beyond me. 
a courtesy message is sent back to the traceroute process back on the originating computer. Accordingly, the traceroute utility can then display the IP address of the first router on the path to the network destination. Traceroute then makes another ping packet as before, but this time the time to live value starts out at 2. The first router along the outbound path decrements it to 1, and the value is decremented to 0 by the second router, which discards it, and sends back another alert message disclosing its disposition. When that alert message returns back to the source, the traceroute utility can display the IP address of the second router on the path to the destination. This process repeats for the next router, and the next, and the next, with the initial time to live field increasing step by step until the ping packet actually arrives all the way to the destination, whereupon a normal ping response is sent back. At the end of the process, Traceroute generates a report that looks like this. This example shows that it is commonplace for each router step to be repeated three times, so that transit times can be averaged for better accuracy. It's also interesting to note that each hop tends to get a little faster and more efficient as the test proceeds. This is because each intervening router's high-speed cache memory remembers details of prior exchanges for a few seconds and doesn't have to perform as many housekeeping or setup chores for the subsequent operations as long as they occur before some other traffic crowds the records out of that cache memory. This example shows that MIT.edu is just five hops away from our PC. The first hop is always forwarded by our own LAN's NAT router, which tends to respond very quickly. The second hop is forwarded by our Boston-based Internet Service Provider. Note that each hop is exercised three times, and the first time our ISP sees our router, it needs 35 milliseconds to respond. After that, it is able to respond a bit faster, probably because some of the information it needs to construct and address the response is still in its temporary high-speed cache memory. The third hop is forwarded by an anonymous router at IP address 4.79.2.2, for which no DNS name is available. The fourth hop comes from a router at IP address 18.168.0.25, which has been assigned DNS name w92.rtr-1-backbone.mit.edu, implying that it resides on the university's campus. The IP address of the final hop is so similar as to imply association with MIT, and the DNS name is web.mit.edu. That name is probably registered to the same computer as MIT.edu in the Internet's domain name servers. From the information in this traceroute report, we can see that our computer enjoys a very good connection with, a ser with the web server at MIT.edu, and that the average round-trip time is a bit less than 49 milliseconds. On a computer running Microsoft's well-known Windows operating system, the command is spelled like this, T-R-A-C-E-R-T, -E that's traceroute in Microsoft, and you follow it with the domain name or IP address of the other computer or router for which you want to discover the route. Give it a try. You will probably find that you can ping almost any computer anywhere in the world within about 15 router hops. It's also interesting to note that once your internet protocol packets make it out of your local network and into the worldwide internet through your service provider, the internet can generally deliver them anywhere in the world and respond back to you within about 100 milliseconds. As you exercise ping and trace route, your understanding of the underpinnings that make the Internet work for you will increase. Armed with the other information available at AskMrWizard.com, you'll be able to understand the big picture of Internet working, solving your own problems, and helping your employers and friends to troubleshoot their networks. We appreciate the attention of our many YouTube viewers. However, if you are watching these video clips only on YouTube, you are missing out on a lot of the very best stuff. This video clip is just one of thousands available at AskMrWizard.com where they are all well organized and easy to find in context, along with related photos, text, discussions, and advertisements from vendors that know these subjects and want to help. Please join us there. We appreciate your support. From YouTube, 
it's easy to find us. Just click on the prominent link at the very beginning of YouTube's descriptive text. Thanks.